Hello, this is Professor David Bishai, and today we're going to be talking about a model of capitation. This model comes out of a, a reading by Tom McGuire, uh, who depicted a, a model where we can see the effects of both capitation on the supply side and the typical demand side cost sharing called copayments. So we're going to get lessons about copayments, lessons about prospectivity, and some numerical results. This is a 1989 paper in Inquiry titled Combining Demand and Supply Side Cost Sharing, the Case of Inpatient Mental Health Care. The McGuire paper sets up both uh, a mathematical and a graphical model of a healthcare encounter in the mental health sphere. So we're being given a model of a patient with a mental health problem that has come into the provider and said, here's my mental health condition and I'd like some help with this. Can you supply me some services? These services in the setting would be inpatient service, the numbers of hours or days or minutes of inpatient admission for a problem like substance addiction or depression or a psychotic episode. Uh, even though the McGuire model is motivated by, a, by an inpatient mental health encounter, the lessons are absolutely general and could apply to any type of situation where we have a a patient with an illness approaching a, a provider with various numbers of insurance contracts. So what we're going to do first is build up the model looking at the graph that's used to depict this encounter and then start to, to look through the various lessons about the co-payments and prospectivity. Part one is going to be the introduction to the McGuire graph. Right now, uh, this is our destination. This is not our starting point, but we are going to be all over this graph in about 10 minutes time. And it's going to help us depict the, the encounter between supply side and demand side. So here's the demand side. This is a patient with a mental health condition or any condition, and they have this downward sloping demand curve that's situated on a, a graph which has a vertical axis, which is price on the left, running from 0 to 1.33 units of money. And the quantity demanded goes from 0 to 5,000 units of services. This might be the number of hours provided of an inpatient stay. Just any unit. Now, this is a perfectly informed, completely rational demand function. Downward sloping red line you see from 1.33 where the price is 1.33 and the demand is zero units of care and the price is zero and the demand is 5,000 units of care. This is a perfectly informed demand curve from a patient that says, I know exactly what my marginal utility is at every point and based on the, the amount of, of price I pay, when I consume this much, this will be my, my, my benefit. I've highlighted the price of one. Today, we will uh, encounter a case where the industry of suppliers finds that they can produce one of these units of care, like an hour in the hospital, at one unit of money. So that's their marginal cost of the industry. Any individual supplier might have, have a different uh, level of, of, of supply and price. The C we'll pay attention to soon. This is the copay and the copayment is a number between zero and one that tells us how much the consumer will pay out of pocket to acquire the, the, the services. And as before, copay times price of one is the price faced by the patient. They look at their demand curve at the intersection point B and say, if I have to pay copay C, I will demand quantity demanded X sub D of services. So plain old demand curve, uh, it's, it's something that that we know and understand and that's going to figure in this model. Now although the market, the industry of suppliers can supply services at marginal cost one, here's a picture of one supplier who is willing to supply more services if the price is higher. And at a high price they're willing to supply a lot of services. You can see at the far right of the curve 
the supply is quite high. And if they get a low price, the supplier is really willing to supply very limited, in fact zero, if they were paid nothing, they don't want to offer any supply of services. So this is a conventional supply, and on this telling of the story, the supplier is getting a low price of zero at the bottom of the vertical axis and a high price at the top of the vertical axis, and the supply curve is doing what you've understood from your prior training in, in microeconomic supply curves slope upwards. So for convenience, what happens in this paper is that we just are going to have a better time if we flip where the low price is and the high price is. So keep your eye on the low price and the high price, and we're just going to turn it upside down. We're going to put the, the high price at the bottom. Now you can see the high price is at zero do dollars of money, and the low price is up in the middle where that horizontal line is. And obviously the supply curve flips upside down. So now uh, when the price is high at the bottom of the graph, supply is also high, and X sub supplied is far, uh, far to the right. And now when the price is low, towards the left of the graph, the quantity supplied still running from zero on the left, that supp quantity supplied is, is closer to zero when the, the, the price is low. So the supply curve flipped upside down, and all we just did was flip the, the order of things on the, the vertical axis. Why is this? What, what makes sense here? So what we're going to say about this upside down supply curve is that when the this vertical axis unit of of price is equal to one, that number is going to be depicted with the notation element little r. And at little r, the supplier is being offered a 100% prospective payment. And at little r equals zero, the supplier is being given a 0% prospective payment. The insurance company says to you, you take care of these 10,000 people and here's a million dollars and whatever happens to them, it's your problem, not my problem. That means that the, the incentive, the profit gained or the revenue gained from any single unit of care for your capitated 10,000 patients with a 100% prospective payment is zero. And as drawn on the graph, when R equals 1 and you have taken your million dollars for your 10,000 patients, your incentive to supply a unit of services just directly on the how much money will I get, that's zero, and you want to supply as little as possible services to these individuals if you've taken a 100% prospective contract. In contrast, if you take a 0% prospective contract, you have to get all of your revenue from from billing and fees, and the more services you supply, the more days in the hospital, the larger your bill is and the more you can get paid from the insurance company. So R goes from zero to one. If you think about what would it be to be in the middle, what would an R of 50% mean? It would mean the insurance company says, take my 10,000 patients and I will give you half a million dollars and you get to bill me 50% off on all of the fees. So that is a 50% prospectivity contract. And at the end, uh, by law of averages, that contract, which is a 50-50 mix, should come out at the same in that population of 10,000 people. We're keeping score of the vertical axis with R equals zero on the left, which is a, a pretty high price per unit of service, and R equals one uh, up at the top. And all we're gonna do now, same, economics, we're just not going to write the r equals zero r and r equals one on the left side of the graph. Watch and it's going to move over to the right side of the graph. But it's the same basic economic story. We're just labeling the labels on the far right. So we've got a supply curve of the supplier and a minute ago we saw the demand curve of the consumer. And I want you to notice something here. The amount that the consumer paid, the C parameter, is being set by the insurer, not the hospital, not the supplier. And the amount that the supplier is receiving, the, the price parameter R, is not being set by the patient. It's also being set by the insurer. The insurer is a middleman. The insurer is saying, 
I will tell the demander what their price is going to be, this C parameter, and I will tell the supplier what their uh, revenue parameter is going to be, this R parameter, but the, the demander, the consumer, and the supplier, they don't set the price to each other. This is completely different from the market for oranges at, at the farmer's market. If you go and buy oranges at the farmer's market, you as consumer say to the orange seller, I would like uh, 50 cents an orange, and they say no, 75 cents, and you say no, 60 cents, and you bargain over the, the price. Here, the price paid is not in control by the supplier and the demander. They do get to bargain, but not over price. They are given the R's and the C's by the insurance company, and then all they get to talk about there in the emergency room of the hospital is how long are you going to admit me to the hospital for? So that's the only thing they get to talk about, but not the price. So this is going to be a funny equilibrium. It's really a, a different sort of an economic model. If you're looking at one of these McGuire graphs, the horizontal axis is going to be expenditures on services, units of service, quantity demanded. And I've been saying it's in minutes, but it might be in uh, dollars of spending on the minutes, uh, but it's still a quantity demanded. Uh, the left vertical axis is where, where we're going to keep track of the co-payment. The right vertical axis, we're going to keep track of the, the capitation spending. And high capitation means low reimbursement and low dollars uh, per unit services for the supplier. So their supply curve turned upside down. D will be a demand curve of perfectly formed patients and the price they see is C, the supply curve is the supply curve of perfectly informed providers. There's not a perfect overlap of the supply curve and the demand curve. I'm going to show you that and talk about it. We're going to show you that there is a quantity demanded by the patient and there is a quantity supplied by the supplier. And in between those two amounts will be an equilibrium that will be achieved after bargaining between the supplier and the demander we have a horizontal axis with expenditure from zero to potentially 5,000 units of service. We've got a supply curve in black, which is showing us that the supplier wants to supply X equals zero when their revenue is very low, when R is very high, and they want to supply 5,000 units of service. So two last points is that the black curve of the, the perfectly informed supplier does not really want to supply the exact same amount as the perfectly informed demander. Why is that? Why don't the providers want to do what the patient thinks is exactly best every single time? Now, the provider is simply an imperfect agent for the consumer. They only care about the consumer's well-being at some uh, altruism parameter that McGuire sets at 0.75. We could redo the model with these two curves lying right on top of each other. It's really not where the important economics is at all. Uh, it's just easier to see what's going on when the graphs don't line up right on top of each other. Uh, the interesting economics comes with what would happen if the, the supplier was a super altruist. What if they always wanted to give the patient more services than they wanted? McCarter considers that and shows that it's, it's just as bad to have a super altruistic provider saying, if you want to stay in the hospital for uh, 50 hours, I want to give you more. I want to give you 60 hours. Ultimately, the, the utility scorekeeping should be done by the red curve of the demand. And then if a provider is super altruistic and wants to give the patient more or wants to give them less, either one is not in the patient's best interest. So trying to, to give more services also lowers utility as much as giving fewer services. Read, read that section if you are going to read the McGuire paper. It's very interesting. But for today, the reason that black curve is below the red curve is because this is a imperfect altruism situation and it really won't change the economics to have the, the providers be perfect altruists. They still have this incentive running with this capitation that creates the, the economic problem in this market. Unlike the market for oranges, 
the price is, is not being negotiated by these two individuals. The, the price seen by the consumer is C, the price uh, seen by the, the, the supplier is R, and when the supplier sees price R hit their black supply curve, they stand up and say, X sub S is the quantity that I want to supply. And when the consumer sees price set by C as their uh, price, they look at their red curve and they say, X sub D is the, the quantity demanded that I want to demand. Now there's a market problem. Supply and demand were supposed to come together in equilibrium, and there should have been a quantity demanded that comes where supply meets demand, but look at these demand and supply curves. They don't intersect at the optimal price. They intersect at two different quantities demanded. They, they don't agree. So the demand side and the supply side have to bargain, and in this paper, uh, we're gonna have them just take the weighted average and say, uh, meet exactly in the middle. And this is uh, an assumption that McGuire can make if he's able to believe that there is equal bargaining power. In game theory, if we have a model where there is a, a bargaining situation where everybody has full information and they're playing a, a game over a fixed pot of resources, they're having to, to cut a pie. Imagine you and your roommate have uh, a pumpkin pie and you need to divide it into two halves or however many units that you need to share. If you have equal party, if A and B have equal equal power and they're bargaining over a pumpkin pie, it's pretty predictable that uh, they'll split it exactly down the middle. And if party A has twice as much power as party B, what we mean by power is what will happen to you when you're trying to divide a pie. In this health bargaining situation, the provider and the patient have equal bargaining power. And now you're going to say to yourself, isn't that crazy? Health is way different than a pumpkin pie. The provider is you know, wearing a white coat and full of power and authority and knowledge. And if they say, you, for your condition, you need 50 hours in the hospital or 40 hours in the hospital, isn't that a big power play? Well, the patients do have the right to sue the provider if they are harmed. They own that right, and uh, that gives them some power too. So it's not a horrible starting assumption to believe that the provider and the patient have equal bargaining power. And there's I mean, certainly cost of launching a lawsuit, and the, the provider's medical knowledge is also colored a little bit by uncertainty. So we're not crazy about this assumption, but it's just gonna be easier for today to learn the economics if we just always uh, say there's equal bargaining power, and then, we solve the problem of quantity supplied and quantity demanded. They don't line up. Where do they meet? In the middle. Now, fun fact, uh, the patient cannot sue their insurance company for giving their doctor a lousy R, and they can't sue the insurance company for giving them a lousy copay. The ERISA law in the U.S. says that health plans are not liable for health harms. You cannot sue your insurer for selling you a contract that made you have a lousy copay or sold your provider a contract that gave them an R that wanted them not to give you a lot of stuff. Ultimately, you're both adults in the room and the insurance company wasn't in the room. And if your provider didn't give you services or you refused services because you didn't like your copay, that's on you. And no one has been, been able yet to sue their insurer. Moreover, uh, this is a federal statute and states that have tried to open up the the ability to sue insurers have, have not been able to prevail over the federal law. Obviously, lawyers of America would love to sue insurance companies in big pockets, but they cannot. So there is bargaining, um, there's bargaining power. What we're about to do now is show what happens to the equilibrium as we move the copayment, which is being depicted on the, the left side vertical axis right here. We're gonna show what happens as we move this copayment from its current point of 20% upwards. You should expect to see all of the action apply to the demand side because co-payments is the price seen on the demand side. The supply, quantity supplied should stick right where it is at X sub S, but the quantity demanded should start to move because the price seen on the demand curve will move. Let's go check it out. Keep your eyes focused on X sub D down here 
eyes focused on x sub d, and here we go with our experiments. We saw c as the copayment goes up, higher and higher, x sub d moves towards closer to zero. The consumer is seeing higher copayments, and they desire less units of service. Now, because the consumer sees less x sub d, but as you notice, x sub s didn't move, but because x sub d is closer to the left, x star kept on moving, and the qu final quantity transacted as we raise copays gets smaller. Copays make, make the final volume of services get smaller. So what happens when the final volume of services gets smaller? I'm going to go and do it again so you can watch um, these green triangle, the orange triangle, and the gray rectangle change size, and we'll go over what they mean. So here we go. As we raise the copay, the x star moves to the left, and the triangle, orange triangle, and the green triangle get smaller and smaller, but this gray rectangle gets bigger and bigger. What are these things? Let's first talk about the the triangle uh, YZA. What does this triangle mean? Well, if you'll notice, its ceiling, the top of it, is the marginal cost of making these uh, these units. Um, marginal cost of of units between X sub S and X star is going on in the the ceiling of this triangle. We start the ceiling at the left at this very special point Y. Why is point Y extremely special? It's special because this is the industry marginal cost and supply curve, and this is the full consumer-based demand curve. So point Y is the uninsured market equilibrium. If there was no insurance and everybody had to pay full out of pocket, no copay, the demand would be right here uh, at x at, at point y. It has nothing to do with excess. This is just a coincidence that excess might be kind of slightly close to this. Don't get confused by that piece of the drawing. The fact is that the part of this triangle, why we start measuring this triangle at point Y is because that's where the demand curve hits the supply curve. The right-hand wall of triangle uh, YZA happens right there at the market that's transacted in this insured market at X star. So we have a ceiling that goes from point Y to point Z, and the height of it is the, the full cost. The floor of triangle YZA is the floor of the demand curve. So these are units that cost way up here at this price, but they're only demanded down at the, the YA line uh, value, this is going to be dead weight loss. This is units in society that society has to produce at full marginal cost, price Y, but they're only valued by the consumer below their marginal cost. We're wasting resources and moral hazard does this to people. When they have moral hazard, when they are induced to buy more than they have to pay for, they have dead weight loss, and triangle YZA is dead weight loss. But you just know noticed that copays made dead weight loss get smaller. That's what we just did. Um, when we ra lower the copay, YZA gets bigger. When we raise the copay, YZA gets smaller. So copays lower dead weight loss. You knew this before. I told you this in prior lectures, and here you're seeing it happening again. Let's go over this gray rectangle. This gray rectangle is all the money that the consumer has to pay out of their pocket at the point of care. So it starts at zero, goes to X star. The height of it is the copay. They pay copay times X star dollars uh, to, to acquire this care. That's something that we don't like to see. It's okay that people pay for their own care, but the whole value of insurance was not having to pay out of pocket at the time of care. We were risk averse. We wanted to pay with insurance dollars to smooth out our lives. So the more and more trying, uh, rectangle, this gray rectangle gets bigger and bigger, the less value of insurance people have. So I will refer to this gray rectangle as the value of insurance 
uh, and as exposure to uninsurance. So it's it's a bad thing. It, it's not dollar for dollar bad the way dead weight loss is. Every piece of the the triangle YZA area is a loss to society, but every piece of this gray rectangle is not a loss to society. It's just money that that has to come from consumers instead of going through insurance companies. It's disutility, though, because people would have liked to not have to pay out of pocket if they could find an instrument, an insurance instrument that let them do that. In the paper, in the McGuire paper, you will see him say that people have a utility function of the units in this gray rectangle, that it gives them disutility, and he says that this utility is proportional to the square of um, th this rectangle, but it's not the actual rectangle. Just so you know, this is a bad thing. We want this to be small, but we can't keep score of it on a dollar for dollar basis. Finally, this orange uh, triangle is lost consumer surplus. What does this mean? It means lost consumer surplus means if you had prevailed in the market and achieved what you wanted, which is X sub D, you would have consumed X sub D and you would have valued it with the ceiling of AB. This little line segment says to us, how valuable would the, were these units that you didn't get because you didn't get absolute power in your bargaining? You wanted to, to get all of these units at point B, you didn't. The supplier bargained with you and pushed you back to X star and you lost out on this value and you lost, as a consumer, an opportunity that you just really never had. No one is guaranteed in life that you will always prevail in every transaction. You're not being harmed by not getting your consumer surplus, but you would have liked to get it. And when you don't get it, you say, "I next time around, I will try to get it. I will search around. If I could find a supplier that lets me get that triangle, I would prefer them. All right, so let's summarize our lesson about what happens with rising copays. Uh, rising copays uh, induce us to want less medical care. We have less mo lo moral hazard, and we want less care, so there's less dead weight loss, uh, and there's uh, we have less uh, lost consumer surplus. The, the triangle of how bad we feel by giving up so much stuff, that's a smaller triangle. This is was a bad feeling, you know, when it was really big out here when I had a zero copay. Look, look at how big this triangle was. Uh, I'm losing a lot because I wanted XD. I had a very low copay. I wanted all this stuff, and my supplier pushed me all the way to X star. I have to wave goodbye to this lost consumer surplus, and it makes me sad. That sadness is diminished if I have such a big copay that I don't want that uh, high unit XD, if I want less X sub D, I feel less bad about how I'm being pushed around and dominated by the supplier. Okay, so copay leaves customers more exposed. It defeats the point of insurance. I'm just talking about that big gray rectangle, so that's a bad thing when we have high copays. Let's move to the other side. On the supply side, what lessons can we learn about prospectivity? Remember, prospectivity means capitation being paid per head. The provider is accepting a sum of money per patient and is responsible for taking care of anything that might go wrong with them. They have an incentive not to offer services because they're at risk. Lovely if the patient can stay healthy, but even if they do get sick, the problem with capitation is an incentive to under-provide services. The providers don't want to work because financially they, they don't get extra money for services. Under fee-for-service, though, the provider wants to over-provide services. They, they keep saying, well, would you like some more? Would you like some more? Because every extra day in the hospital is extra money flowing to the provider. So the drawbacks we know is under provision. There could be denial of services, discharging people out of the hospital too early, adverse events. There is a bit of an inefficient imposition of risk uh, when we ask the provider to bear risk when you're capitated as a provider, you essentially are an, a miniature insurance company. Instead of the, the insurance company pooling tens and tens of thousands of people, now <clears throat> a hospital with a couple hundred beds is now covering risk of all of the people it's capitated for.
insurance company's job in life was to form those large groups to pool risk. And when they capitate it, uh, they just move their risk out. So we paid them to pool risk and then they shed the risk and they send the risk out to tiny little hospitals that's pretty inefficient. But if they could do it, they're going to want to do it. Why bear risk if someone else will show up and take it for you because you're so strong you can push them into doing that. So now let's do some experiments where we see the effects of, of capitation on the sizes of these market measurement parameters. We're going to raise R and when R goes up the supplier is closer to fully capitated. When they're fully capitated they have no desire to offer services. And they're looking at this R parameter and as it goes up they become fully capitated. Their desire to supply will move to the left and you'll see what happens. As they get more and more fully capitated their desire to supply is smaller. They want to offer less services. When we offer them an even lower, uh, more capitation, closer to one, less services. So X sub S is moving to the left. The demand side, X sub D, isn't moving. The consumers don't care about the prospectivity. They stay put at X sub D. But as the supplier moves to the left, they're pulling X star to the left along with the, the, the market is moving. And because the market's moving to the left, what do we finally see? Well, the final number of transactions is small, so the deadweight loss is small. We're closer and closer to having no deadweight loss because there's fewer services. We've constrained the number of hospital days with capitation. We haven't, we've changed the size of this rectangle by chopping off on the right. The copay, the height of the gray rectangle is still little c. Copayments co height hasn't changed, but the right border of the gray rectangle has been shifting in as capitation lowers the quantity supplied and lowers X star. So the patient is being less exposed to having to pay out of pocket because there's less services, less days in the hospital. What got really big though is this dissatisfaction of having to lose your lost consumer surplus. Uh, this orange triangle got big because now the supplier is farther and farther away from the demander in terms of where they want to be. And so this leaves a sour taste in the demand side in the consumer's life. So the consumers, uh, the gatekeepers uh, will gatekeep down the medical spending. They'll say, you can't stay in the hospital. I'm capitated. I get nothing out of you staying here. I think you should only stay for uh, a day or a half a day. Um, so the, the gatekeeper's restraint is restraining the deadweight loss and they will make consumers feel bad. Uh, there are consumers wishing that, you know, seeing, look, I've got this great insurance policy, I'd rather have these large numbers of units of service, but the gatekeeper says no. And the more the gatekeeper says no, the uh, less happiness the, the consumer might have. But again, they will they will simply succumb to the bargaining. They might feel bad about the bargaining though. We conclude, if we have a situation where there's a highly prospective situation where there are no co-payments, very prospective, but no one co-payments at all, we would expect to see a very low risk cost. The gray rectangle, when I say risk cost, it's gray rectangle, that's very low. I would expect to see a low a dead weight loss because the green triangle is very small. But this sense of conflict, this sense that I'm not getting what I thought I could get with my insurance plan gets higher. Are there true costs imposed on society because the consumer feels this way? Well, the answer is yes if the, the consumers now go out of this encounter and search around the market. If they go scheduling visits with other hospitals and go doctor shopping and hospital shopping, that is a cost to society. All of those brief encounters of searching is our units of, of value that the society has to use. However, if the system simply says to consumers, you only have one option. There's only one hospital you ever get to see with our insurance plan. There's only one doctor. There's no searching, and the consumer really never had our basic human right to have their consumer surplus. Nobody deserves their consumer surplus, but it doesn't stop people from feeling bad when they don't get it. Last thing that happens in this paper is that we 
try out some numerical examples. We're going to try out experiments. So this is exactly what a lot of the work of health economics is. We want to try out a policy, see if we can make the system better, see if we can solve some of the market failures in, in the system. Market failure we're solving today looks like moral hazard problem. We've got these inefficient uh, pieces of utilization and we want to set R and C to try to minimize them, but there's a balance. So let's go through it. What McGuire does in the paper is he says, I'm now going to keep score of these various pieces of the graph. And I'm going to, oh, here's his scorecard. You can see he uses the first two columns to set the knobs and the dials in his model. He's going to set C equal to zero, R equal to zero. And then he's going to keep score. He's going to say, uh, what is the uh, X uh, the quantity demanded in the system. What is the dead weight loss, the triangle YZA? What is the value in utility terms of the gray rectangle, the risk cost? I've added a, a column for you that McGuire didn't add, uh, triangle ABC. So he doesn't include it. He keeps his final score in the column heading McGuire's total cost. I keep score uh, by adding on the triangle ABC. And if I put a utility function around triangle ABC, I might get a different uh, patient you know, utility score. So if I believe that the patient's utility is some uh, summation of McGuire's total cost, triangle ABC, I keep score differently from McGuire. But let's let McGuire start doing his thing. So he's going to set his dials. He's going to set copay zero, R equals zero. He's going to say, the model says that quantity demanded in that setting is 5,000. The dead weight loss in that setting is going to be 1875. No risk cost at all because copay is zero. Uh, his total cost, as you can tell, he only includes the sum of the dead weight and the risk cost. And he says that that's a pretty high total cost to society. They have no risk cost, but they've got this high dead weight loss given his parameters. For me, if you include the size of the triangle of loss consumer surplus giving some sense of disutility, patient's utility is, is quite high here. They're happy that they don't have a high uh, loss consumer surplus. So if you go down this table and look at different settings, these are all options with no capitation. We're going to try to make the system better not by adding capitation, we're just going to do the best we can with raising up the copay to 0 0.2, 0 0.25 at the very bottom. How do we do then? Well, if we start getting the copay up to 0.25, we can reduce medical uh, utilization down by about 10 percent, down to 4,500 units of this service. When they've reduced their utilization, we've reduced the dead weight loss down to 1435 but we've increased the risk cost. So McGuire's scorekeeping says that that's good. Uh, that is a lower total cost because now they've they've got you know, less dead weight. We've added risk cost. We've lowered dead weight. In the end, the bottom row of this table is better from McGuire than the top row from McGuire. But if you look at the consumer surplus triangle, uh, that got worse. They're, they're feeling worse about their their lost consumer surplus. And if I use my own calculation of how much utility might be lost when you have this lost consumer surplus, utility might be, be down. So McGuire says it's better at 1821.9 uh, compared to 1875. And I say, well, maybe that patient disutility got worse. But the experiment shows that you can lower dead weight loss uh, and there's gonna be a trade-off. You have more risk cost, you have less dead weight loss, could be a little bit better if we have some copay. Now McGuire is going to try model settings where he keeps prospectivity at its maximum prospectivity at R equals one. And now check what can we do with the copay. So at the top row, he says, let's do copay of zero, no patient cost sharing at all, but fully capitated R equals one. And wow, what happened now is that the risk cost is zero the dead weight loss is pretty small at 208, uh, and his McGuire's version of total cost is that's a winner. That's the best McGuire does in his whole paper. 
is absolutely no uh, co-payment and everything is on the gatekeeper. But if, if everything is on the gatekeeper, they are doing maximal gatekeeping, the patient is doing minimal restraint of their demands, and so the lost consumer surplus of triangle ABC is quite high at 833, and that uh, might not be so, so amazing for the patient. If you look at the table, as we increase our co-pays higher and higher, we don't make it better for McGuire. He's keeping score uh, in his McGuire's total cost column. And as we increase the co-pay from 0 to 0 0.25, uh, the deadweight loss gets smaller and smaller because there's less quantity transacted. We take quantity transacted from 2,500 at the top to 2,031.25 at the bottom really tiny dead weight loss now at 81.38 but the risk cost goes up because the patient has to pay out of pocket and that risk cost is the the utility of having to pay out of pocket is valued at 147.69 mcguire's ends his paper by saying that he can minimize the cost to society of insurance contracts if we set copays of zero and we have fully capitated contracts to providers. He says that's the best thing. You'll have the smallest risk cost because there's no co-payment. People are fully insured, but then they go to encounter their, their gatekeeper and the gatekeeper restrains their utilization using bargaining and we end up with this low dead weight loss. Uh, back in uh, 1989, this type of thinking led to uh, a decade of insurance plans that had a lot of capitation. There's a specter hanging over this model, which is that people were bargaining and in and, and high conflict with their, with their provider. So let's talk about what happened during this era. During the 18, 1980s and 1990s, there was a managed care era. In this, the end of the 21st century, the managed care contracts did a lot of this. They had capitated contracts with providers and provider networks. You'd get a managed care card and it could say you can only go to these three hospitals and these pay, uh, physician groups will, will see you. Those contracts are still out there by the way. These products uh, led to a lot of uh, consumerist backlash. In our model what was happening was that the lost consumer surplus that triangle ABC got bigger and bigger the more your gatekeeper was the thing keeping you away from what you wanted because you were facing tiny little copay of almost nothing it was always the gatekeeper so there's dissatisfaction people would have these plans and say yeah great premium but my health insurance plan is focused on controlling costs they don't care they don't care about me or if you were working for a firm that only offered these managed care options for your health insurance, you would say, why is my employer offering such lousy health insurance? I would rather work for the other firm down the street where I can get a, a fee-for-service contract where the prospectivity is not one, but 0.2 or 0.1 or not even prospective at all. Furthermore, uh, the provider networks grew and gained the power to not accept full capitation. You could insist and shove it to a provider network and say, look, we have all the patients, you're this teeny little provider, you're going to have to take R equals one. They don't want R equals one, it's risky. As the provider networks grow and grow, they'll say back to the insurance company, no way, we are not taking R equals one. Uh, we'll take your patients at R equals Point two, we won't be fully fully prospectively capitated. At the end of the 90s and beginning of this current century, there was a shift. The consumers won, and the, the employers didn't want to have lousy health insurance. They were losing in the labor market. They can't get good employees if their insurance policies are lousy. So we have, starting about 20 years ago, a move toward using the co-pays, using uh, demand side restraints rather than supply side restraints. So we're seeing now an era called the consumer driven health insurance era. This f looks to our model like the copay is the thing restraining utilization. What happened in the er early part of the century was the, the formalized legislation that 
helped enable the rise of health savings accounts. In a health savings account, the employee and potentially the employer can put money in a tax-exempt health savings account fund that sits there as an account that you can draw from uh, if you need to, but if you don't use your HSA fund, it grows over time. You only can use your HSA fund to help pay for medical expenses, typically for deductibles. So you would get a health savings account if you had a very low premium, high deductible, seven, eight thousand, five thousand dollar deductible plan. And that way on January 1st, you have this horrible coverage. You've got to pay every dollar out of demand side, but you would draw that from your health savings account. And because you felt like it was your own money, you would restrain your demand. You would go to this encounter with the provider and say, you know, it is my health savings account money and I can roll it over. So I actually don't want to stay in the hospital for 50 hours. I'd rather stay for 40 hours. That way I would not use up my health savings account. You're using your your co-payment essentially, your, your exposure to the deductible to restrain your utilization. So we also have way more uh, high deductible plans out in the market that if you are going to uh, get your first em employment contract, you will see a menu. You'll be given a menu, whether or not you have an HSA option, you will be uh, encountering high premium, low deductible options versus low premium, high deductible options. That's what's happening in the marketplace for both employer driven and even the individual insurance market under the, uh, the Affordable Care Act has this, I am going to choose the low premium and high deductible. I will voluntarily have a high copay stand between me and good care. So when you are when you are in possession of a high deductible plan, you don't go to these encounters and say it's miserable. My gatekeeper kept me away from care. You become your own gatekeeper. The consumer restrains their own demand in this era of the consumer-driven health insurance plans, which is where we are right about now. So let's summarize. What did we learn? We saw from this model that there are two instruments to control cost. We can make the demand side face higher and higher co-pays, in which case they don't want to give up their money and they think about their demand curve and restrain their utilization. Or we can make the gatekeeper say to the patient, I will not let you have that service. I'm the doctor, you can't have it uh, because of my contract with your insurance company it makes me not want to give you all the services you want. On both sides, if we raise the co-pays and make patients have to pay more, they don't use as much and they restrain the moral hazard, dead weight loss is lower. But then they're more exposed to this risk cost. They're less insured, frankly, if you have a high copay, you're not as insured. If we make the supply side uh, incentivized to restrain utilization, they hold back utilization they lower dead weight loss because there's just isn't as much utilization going on. However, there's this higher perception that the provider's incentives are not aligned with yours. Now, this isn't really a cost if you can't do anything about it, but in the end, after you've been able to shop around the market, you won't go back to that insurance company, you won't go back to that firm that's employing you if you feel rotten using your health insurance plan. Power and politics will drive an oscillation between this demand side and the supply side cost controls. But what you've seen is that what, what sunk this model, McGuire did fabulous economics. He's right about the, the dollars and cents of what costs what. But what was left out of the model was this lousy feeling that consumers had that they were not getting what they wanted and how they felt, which was not in the economic model, that's what finally sunk this enthusiasm that insurance companies had for prospectivity and fully capitated contracts. That ended up mattering as much as dollars. What economists often leave out of their money-driven, dollar-driven models of utility is how something feels. And we'll see that there's corrections for that going on already in how we go about using economics. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry.
Thank you.